should a Christian think about or do about global warming? What should a Christian think about or do about uh, homeless young people? What should we think about or do about hotel opening hours, things like that? Well, these are really difficult questions. They're social action questions. I don't know the answers to any of them, but the Dean of Sydney, Philip Jensen, knows the answers to all of them. Yes, and we're going to solve them in a day. Let's see. <laughs> Let's see what we can do in 20 minutes. When it comes to social action, there are some social action questions that really passionately concerned some Christians out there. Yes, uh, but uh, there are very few that passionately concern all Christians. So we're a bit selective about these things. Oh, very selective. And often the, the thing that drives us is not the scriptures, uh, but, but our society. Right. And so certain issues that our society sees as important at a particular period of time, we follow along and show a Christian implications or the Christian understanding of these particular issues. But we might be absorbing it from a left-wing agenda or a, 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 a conservative agenda yes. or a green agenda or something yeah, like that. Right. And different churches, different Christian traditions uh, are connected to different ones. We need to be a bit critical and, and stay, say to ourselves, hang on, I need to examine my assumptions and where these concerns are coming from? Yes, I think so. Um, that's not to say that the issues the world thinks are problems that need sorting aren't problems that need sorting. They may well have put their finger on a real issue that needs sorting. But uh, to really get a Christian worldview on the social problems, we need to read the Bible to see its worldview problems. So consistently in the Bible, uh, God is concerned for widows and orphans. Right. So poverty so, is always going to be a concern for Christians. That, that is going to be a concern. Well, not poverty necessarily, but widows and orphans are. <laughs> um, there's, there's all kinds of teachings in the scriptures about poverty, uh, some of which in the book of Proverbs uh, speaks in poverty in terms that, well, you are lazy. Yes. Yeah, yes. So you are sluggard. So it's, it's your fault. But the widows and orphans who can't care for themselves, we have to be concerned we about We do it. have to be always concerned for them. Yes. So if, if we're going to look for that big biblical Christian worldview, it's going to be a big worldview, and it's going to include things like, is the world getting better or getting worse, isn't it? Well, it does uh, for many people, yes, uh, but that's, that's, a, that's a theological view. Right. Um, uh, I remember reading a quote many years ago, uh, a historian who said, if, uh, if all moralists are to believe, uh, Britain has been in decline since 1066. <laughs> <laughs> so it, moralists are always on that kind of negativity. Um, theologically, the... Uh, post-millennialists have a tendency to believe the world is good and getting better. Right. Christianity will take over and then Christ and, will return. Yes, and premillennialists tend to see things as bad and getting worse. The Antichrist will take over and then Christ will return. Yeah. <laughs> and amillennialists, well, they're A, they're, they don't have anything, do they? Well, they see so, the millennium as being everything from everything. the first coming to the second coming. Which, and there is, there is a picture that Christ paints of a world full of bits of good and bad, wheat and tares kind yes. of things in there. Well, there is. So, uh, but also, of, uh, you will hear of wars and rumours of wars. Uh, that will, that's not the end. That is an indication that the world is coming to an end, but it's not an indication when the world comes to an end. But there is no indication that in this world before Christ returns that wars will be done away with. Wars are done away with with the return of Christ. So, so with that mixture, is that why bits of the world seem to be getting better? Like, you know, our grandparents didn't have digital watches. Uh, and uh, people say, but there, there are, there's evidence the world is getting worse because you get diseases like AIDS that we didn't have before. So is this state of flux a fairly normal yes. state of affairs? Yes, flux means constant change. Right. And that's what, we, that's what we have in this world and will always have because... We humans have been put in the world to care for the world, to look after the world, to rule the world, but we are incompetent and incapable of doing it. And so you find in the, uh, the Tower of Babel story that God sees man and sees that humanity can do all things. And so he confuses our languages to prevent us from doing all things. Because we won't do good things. We won't do good things if we, we would invade heaven. That's what we would do, make ourselves to God, to be God. So we are incompetent in the running of this world. And the world is just more complicated than we are ever able to solve the problems of it. And we are more sinful than we will ever be able to uh, rule the world in justice. 
So we keep on electing in people to power who over time become corrupted by the power that we elect them into. And yes. they, most politicians, I, the politicians I've met, have always gone into politics with high principles. Um, notoriously, politicians don't have high principles when they come <laughs> out the other end. Uh, the process destroys them. So, seeing the big picture is as complex as that and as bitsy as that, it means we're always going to look at the world and see th things that are a mess. Yes. So should we, as Christians, be concerned about cleaning them up and trying to clean up the mess? Well, yes. You see, take the uh, African slave trade. That was a mess. And uh, Christians were key leaders in cleaning up that mess. Uh, though some Christians were involved in the mess. Um, but the leadership of cleaning up the mess was also by Christians. But having cleaned up that mess, we, we didn't solve the problem of European imperial invasions. You know, we, we left other problems on the side while yes. we cleaned up this mess. And by the time you kind of come to these other things, slavery has crept back into our world. And so it is still operating now in the world. And kidnapping, ransoming people was one of those things that we did away with. Piracy we did away with. Well, piracy has come back, back again. Back again, yes. Kidnapping has yes. come back again. And we are just unable to take on everything and, and control it and fix it. But, but, but granted that the world is like that, if, we, if we're aware of something that's a mess and that is, that is wrong, that is going to be wrong in the eyes of God, unrighteous, it's still appropriate for us, if we can, to tackle it and try to do something about it? Yes, uh, because we were created by God to rule this world and because we should act rightly and, and because we care for this world, especially things that are wrong in terms of treatment of people because people matter to God and they should matter to us. We can't love humanity without being concerned for oppression and tyranny. Uh, we should always be concerned for widows and orphans and not just for widows and orphans who are going to have eternal life, we should be concerned for them in this lifetime. The improvement of society is something that anyone who lives in a society, who cares for their children and their grandchildren, should be concerned for. Um, uh, nationalism is a dangerous thing, but in a sense, if you are a citizen of a city or of a nation, then its health and welfare is something that you should be concerned for. But there's a certain uh, arrogance in thinking that you personally are going to fix up all the mess in this world. <laughs> right. Well, w we may find ourselves, if we decide we're going to help try to tackle a, a particular problem, a particular mess, whether it's slavery or prison reform or whatever it happens to be, we'll f we may find ourselves standing beside people who believe all the messes can be solved. Yes. That the world can be steadily made better and better. Yeah. Um, now, what do we say to that view? Well, it's naive. It fails to understand sin and it fails to understand the complexities of life. Uh, and they are going to be disillusioned in due time. Uh, and we mustn't be seduced into thinking that the contribution we're making on this particular issue is really going to make a fundamental difference on the wider issue. See, even on a particular issue. I remember many years ago we had a referendum in, in New South Wales, wasn't it, about the closing hours of pubs. Christians came out very strongly about keeping the pubs closed for six o'clock. Yep. Um, and the, uh, the churches ran a big campaign to keep six o'clock closing. It was changed and the ten o'clock closing came in. Now, the rhetoric that was used about the drunkenness that would follow um, uh, uh, it seems was completely wrong because the, the six o'clock swill created a lot of drunkenness. Leaving the pubs open till 10 o'clock did not create more drunkenness in our community. That is, the decision w was being made, Christians are concerned for the welfare of families that drunkenness is minimised in our society, not maximised, is a good Christian concern. But the particular mechanism by which to do that <laughs> Was wrong. So working out the practicalities of what will actually flow in a complex society is a very difficult thing to That's do. Right. That's why you have Christians on both sides of a political debate. Because what we, we may be agreeing that we want to uh, create more wealth or have better justice systems, 
But how you do it, which mechanism you use, on any particular issue, you can have disagreement. And there, there, is, there is this picture that I think is a non-Christian worldview that human history is like going up a hill. And every generation is a bit better than every previous generation, <laughs> and we're getting better all the time. We, we mustn't fall into that one, surely. No. Our prisons are as full now as they've ever been. In fact, they were full. Um, uh, we, we're not doing better. We, the Fabians thought that if we educated people, housed people, clothed people, fed people, we would do away with crime. Well, 100 years later, we haven't. What we've got now are criminals who are better educated, better clothed, better housed, <laughs> but we haven't done away with crime. So, so what's, what's happening is people aren't taking sin seriously. Absolutely. And there can be a, bit, a tendency for Christians sometimes not to see how big and how appalling on a cosmic scale sin is. Absolutely. Yes, it's naive, the, the naivety that uh, is around about sin. But sin is a deep-seated problem. And so we solve the censorship problem by allowing people to publish anything and everything, and then what they publish is anything and everything. Yes, <laughs> and they yes. say, well, hang on, we don't want that. But now you can't put the genie back in the bottle because that's all out there. That material is there now. It's un And the... The people who fought for freedom of speech, which is a very important principle to preserve truth and to preserve intellectual debate, uh, are themselves now embarrassed by some of the stuff that has come out. And they never, they never thought it would lead to they that. They never thought it would lead to that because they didn't know the sinfulness of the human heart. Right. We do. Mm -hmm. We'll take that into account. So against that background what is it we actually do as christians we we know that human beings are sinful the human heart is sinful but we still know god demands righteousness of it so 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 we can't ignore a mess in front of us no. what do we do we, we we have to address the messes that we see and we address them with a christian perspective so we know for example that just having more wealth in the community does not solve the big problems and so gambling may create wealth in the community because it keeps the money turning around and that's good economics. But we know that long term, in terms of the quality of people's lives, it is totally destructive and it is destructive of the kind of ethics and morale of society. So we oppose something like gambling in principle. But when you're in a mixed society as we are, when the society is so heavily indebted to gambling, there will be different political decisions as to how we oppose gambling, what level of gambling we will or will not tolerate. I mean, it's like prohibition on alcohol. Uh, again, Christians could see the damage alcohol was doing, but total prohibition led, so it is said, to a whole range of other problems <laughs> that didn't solve. Well, the criminalisation of, of alcohol distribution and things like that, I guess. Yes. But it, 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 by having it as a criminal activity, it opened up the uh, underworld's uh, running of speakeasies and the rest, and it actually undermined justice to such an extent that after four or five years, prohibition of alcohol was done away with. Now, we address a problem, but we've got to address problems recognising that the wisdom of how best to address the problem is not given to us necessarily. The non-Christian may have it as much as the Christian. And two Christians may be in complete disagreement as to how to handle the issue. So we need to be a bit gentle with each other. Very gentle with each other and open and generous with others in the political debate and discussion. Because there is no solution ultimately in this world. We're moving the, the dirt from one side of the room to another side of the room. We just do what we can to stop people being hurt, we think. As best we, we can. As best we can. And to a, with a, a limited... Uh, expectation as to how much we can do with a Christian perspective on issues that should influence the debate we mustn't withdraw from the debate because others won't hear us but um, politics is compromise so if, if there's a debate in the community on let, let's say euthanasia um, for Christians to be involved in the debate and to speak up and say things is a reasonable thing to do absolutely in a free society we've got every right to do so and we have certain contributions to make which are really important, such as the value of human life and the sinfulness of humanity, which means you cannot be trusted with the life of another person. Yes, yes. And so we can say, look, you allow euthanasia in due time, you'll have people coercing their elderly relatives, especially the wealthy ones, to, to accept suicide and so on. And 
we know that's going to happen. We can point out things on the basis of what God tells us about human nature. Absolutely. And we should do so. We can do so on the basis of God says that we haven't got the right to do this. We can also do it on the basis of uh, the outworking that we can expect, the pragmatic discussion. We yes. can enter into the pragmatic discussion. So pragmatically, whatever. older people, probably older women, because they live longer than men, will end up being pressured to die. Yes, and we know that's going to happen, and it's only right for us to be pointing that out. But um, in the end, we live in a, a, a mixed, confused world, and when we lose one debate, uh, we win another. When we win one, we lose one. It's and we, always going to be. And we don't make the mistake of assuming that everything hangs off winning this debate or no. that debate. No. And sure. in that, then, we don't make the mistake of uh, attaching Christianity totally to this debate. Right. So that if, if this debate is lost, Christianity is finished yes. sort of thing. Yes. Yeah. So, so we're not going to make that mistake. But there is a, is there, with some of these big social action issues, the mistake of putting Band-Aids on cancer? Yes. That is papering it over and ignoring what's going on underneath, in a yes. way? Yes, that is almost always what we're doing. Uh, now, uh, Band-Aids are very good things. This is not an advertisement for a brand <laughs> name, but Band-Aids are very good things. And it's an important part of medical treatment that you address the symptoms as well as the disease. Um, because the symptoms hurt, the symptoms have got problems. So you, you need to address the symptoms, and so it's right to put Band-Aids on things. But you mustn't confuse treating symptoms with addressing disease. Uh, and ultimately, if you've got a choice, you address the disease rather than the symptoms. Right. But you mustn't confuse those two. Because you are dealing with a big social issue, um, uh, global warming, you may think that you're actually dealing with the disease. But global warming is not the disease. Uh, our lifestyle, our rejection of God, our self-centeredness, there's a whole range of stuff that may lie behind this big issue. And if we're not addressing that, those big issues, those real issues, then you know, cutting emission levels really is not going to change things. In fact, what that does is to raise another question. Is preaching the gospel a kind of social action? Yes, it is the fundamental social action. Because it's only when people's hearts are changed that society will be changed. And so by a minority group pushing through government, a legislative change does not change society. And you'll find that people will just find new ways around the laws. There's always new ways around the laws. And or if the laws are really so good as to stop that form of sinfulness, they'll invent another form of sinfulness. So <laughs> yes. you, you, you never can win by legislation. Yes. You win by changing society. And the changing way you, hearts. The change society is changing hearts. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So is it possible actually to look back over history and to see times when the, the Christians, the real born-again Bible-believing Christians, were a significant percentage, because the percentage goes up and down at different yes. times, and that, that had an effect? Yes, you can see it at different times. You can see it in a microculture. Um, a friend of uh, mine, of ours, went to Africa to, to do agricultural education. Uh, he noticed that after his first three years there that actually the people he was trying to educate knew everything about growing all the crops and looking after all the animals. They needed no agricultural education, but they continued to live in abject poverty because they were constantly caught up in, in intertribal warfare. And so they were burning each other's crops and stealing each other's animals. And the poverty didn't lie in lack of agricultural knowledge, the poverty lay in morality, in spirituality. And so he turned the agricultural college into a Bible college. Right. Because out of the Bible college would come a changed heart to the community, which would then allow for the agriculture to improve. So you, now there's a microcosm of what can happen, and yes. in fact yes. did happen. Uh, Wilberforce and the Clapham sect, etc., they certainly did put pressure upon the idea of uh, improving society. It wasn't just slavery was one issue, but they're actually for they the They tackled a lot of issues, didn't they? They tackled a lot of issues, but the improvement of society was one of those issues. And out of the evangelical revival of the 18th century and the Wesleys and moving into the 19th century, there was a significantly increased percentage of Bible-believing Christians to whom could then bring about change within society. But it didn't last permanently. It, you know, within a generation or two, it had 
weakened. The Wilberforce's children turned away from the faith of their father and moved into other faiths. And it was with, by the end of the century, it had become the kind of formalism that uh, uh, that people made fun of in the Victorian, the eminent Victorians. But to some extent, surely we, we mustn't be too tortured about the future. God's made us responsible for the time in which we live and the place in which we live. And we can't do everything thinking, how will this work in a hundred years' time? We have to tackle right. what's in front of us. Nor look back and say, oh, they were the golden days when yes. all works. Okay. Yeah, they weren't golden days. They were pretty awful days. But from what you're saying, the, the, the idea that we preach God's gospel or the social gospel, it, it's uh, simply a wrong contrast. If we preach God's gospel, it, it has an impact on society. It has social implication. But, the, and, but there are two mistakes, I think, Kel. One is to talk about doing social, social and, and, the, and preaching the gospel as two parallel things. Yep. The other one is to put the social one in front of the gospel. Right. Uh, the, 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 the way forward is to preach the gospel. The gospel has social implications. It will change people, and changed people will change society. But if you try and get society changed through gospel, through uh, preaching, then in fact you won't preach the gospel and you won't change hearts and you won't change society. What you will do is move into parliament. Yes. Pass laws, pass rules. Right. You're using the non-Christian methodology to bring about change. So we, we really need to be focused upon the gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen, eternal life. That's where the focus needs to be. That's right. And when a person is born again, they will see the injustices around about them in a new and fresh light. And one of our problems we've found in some of the harder suburbs of Sydney to live in is that when people get uh, converted, they leave. Right. Uh, so one of my friends was in a church where in a very difficult suburb and uh, he saw someone converted each month for about five years and at the end of five years the church was no bigger than when he started. And that's because when people got converted they looked around at the suburb and they said this is no place to raise my children. They stopped drinking, they stopped gambling, they started earning more money, they worked more responsibly, they moved out of the suburb. <laughs> so, uh, church growth has always got a certain problem to it in yes, terms of yes. as the test of good ministry. It was a great ministry. Good work for the kingdom. Great work for the kingdom. But uh, these people's lives were changed. Now you can say, well, look, if they were that changed, why didn't they stay in that suburb and regenerate that suburb? And that could be one of the options that people have. But these new Christians didn't take that option. My friend, he did, because hmm. he went and worked in that suburb and lived in it with his family and sent his children to the local school with his family. It's all people converted and saved forever and <laughs> moving out. And moving out. Now, against that, that background of seeing social action in, in those complex terms, because it's never simple, what's the church's role? You know, a local church, a congregation, whatever, do they have a role in this or not? Well, we can on certain really fundamental issues of absolute Christianity, like believing in life uh, and its integrity and that people shouldn't be allowed to murder. Uh, upholding those kinds of things over which there can be no doubt that this is what the Bible is teaching. But in general, no. When churches as churches take on social action, they have a tendency either to be very selective about what they're doing or to coerce their members into this or changing the agenda of the church so church becomes the local political party rather than the hearing of the God's word or being coercive on the community. Uh, always dangerous when you link church and state together. When governments become religious and when religions become governments, that's when tyranny and persecution comes in. Individual Christians should take the social action that they by conscience are convinced that they should be doing. So for church and, and government to be holding hands like that, bad for church, bad for government. Yeah. But individual Christians, should being be aware involved. of people's needs, and doing what they can. Should be and will be involved like that because you can't love your fellow man, which is what the gospel will bring you to do, and allow them to be abused or tyrannised or oppressed. And that's going to, to work out in, we will just help individuals when we get the opportunity to, but we'll also write a letter to our local member of parliament or... Or become our local member. Or become the local member of parliament. Right. 
But I'm expecting in Parliament to see some of the one side of the party uh, politics and some of the other part of the politics both being Christians. Because they both agree we're trying to improve society, they will be disagreeing about how we improve society and who we can work with to improve society. When the church takes it on, it doesn't allow for that difference. And so there tends to be this church, everybody votes this way, and that church, everybody votes that way. And that doesn't seem to me the way to be doing it. Partly what we need to do is to be generous with each other and recognise the complexity, because I, I get the impression from here that in America the assumption is if you're a Christian you want to go into politics as only one party you'll stand for. Now Depending that's, if you're white or African-American. <laughs> if you're coming from your community. Yes. Uh, and that's the kind of thing we need to be able to question yes. um, and say, I'm going to do what I can do in my situation. There isn't a package for me, if you know what I mean. No, that's right. And I'll, I'll perceive it differently. Uh, there's no agreement amongst economists as to what is the best economic system. Get two economists, get three opinions. Yes. Exactly. So why, why would you expect, therefore, a government which is dealing with economics to have a view? It's going to have diversities of views, and Christians will reflect that diversities of views because there's no one economic system that the Bible approves of. So we need to continue focusing on preaching the gospel, sharing the gospel, and we need at the same time to be sensitive to hurt around us and whatever little bit we can do to help in our little area, we should be doing. That's right. And if we move to doing more socially, the social gospel always swallows up the true gospel. Right. Because when I uh, help the weak and the poor and the lame, etc., the world loves me. When I preach repentance, the world hates me. So every time I preach love and kindness and, and work for it, I get reinforced positively. Every time I preach repentance, I get reinforced negatively. Over time, the preaching of the gospel gets swallowed up. By the so we, we have to be really aware that preaching the gospel has to always be front and centre and it mustn't ever take over our social action or social right. welfare. Engine, engine and, and, and uh, carriages. Okay. The carriages will not work without the, the engines engine pulling, pulling them. them. <laughs> <laughs> and you mustn't get them the wrong way around unless you're shunting. And if you'd like to hear more of the wisdom of Philip Jensen, come along any Sunday, St Andrew's Cathedral in Sydney. When Philip is teaching the Bible, unpacking the scriptures, always a good thing to do. We'd love to see you. Thank you for your company. Philip, thank you for yours. It's a pleasure. And we'll see you again next time on The Chaplain.